Praise the Lord, and uh, it is uh, another wonderful time that we can be able to join together and be able to share in the things that uh, we would like to learn. Sometimes these things perplex us, but uh, God continue making them simple for us to understand. This is number 13 in the series, The Prophets and the Messengers. And today, uh, from uh, this uh, presentation, I'm dealing with uh, an appeal to common sense, what E.G. White had to say on various uh, uh, topics and uh, discussions and doctrinal matters that uh, we have and how we have to react uh, when we come to the truth. And so I'd like us to pray and then uh, be able to continue. Uh, dear Father in heaven, thank you for your love upon mankind and giving thy son for an atonement and signing our emancipation papers. I pray that, Lord, we may appreciate the work of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary and in our lives, that uh, we may be able to walk in the truth while still it is the day for night, for the night cometh when uh, there'll be darkness and it shall be a hard time. We pray that uh, we may be prepared at such a time as this. In Jesus' name, amen. And so an appeal to common sense. And uh, right now I'm going to just look at the issue, uh, the age of schooling and uh, which school to take our children. And so this is, uh, I pray that this is going to be something that will interest us and uh, will help us move closer to the truth. Um, in uh, 1902, the community surrounding the St. Helena Sanitarium, a community in which Ellen White resided from 1901 until her death, was served by the One Room Crystal Springs Public School. It was taught by a dedicated Seventh-day Adventist teacher called uh, Mr. Anthony. At the turn of the century, Seventh-day Adventists in some parts of the United States, largely as the result of Ellen White's counsel, were just moving into the establishment of church schools for the children of grade school age. At uh, around uh, 6 a.m. on Monday of July 14, 1902, Ellen White addressed the members of the sanitarium church, urging the establishment of a church school and as an incentive offered to provide the use of a nearby portion of her land at El Elmshaven for the project. Uh, experts from the timely address she gave open actually this discussion on the age of uh, taking her children to the school and what school more so are we talking about now, the sanitarium church accepted Ellen White's proposal of having a school church and uh, accepted her offer of uh, Elm a uh, uh, portion of land to set up the school. Uh, but when the school opened in the fall, no provision was made for small children because it was reasoned that those under eight or 10 years of age should be taught at home in harmony with Ellen White's instruction given earlier. Now, th this gets interesting because the Seventh-day Adventist had been taught that uh, the only teacher for the child from zero to eight years was to be the mother. And in the previous sessions, I have talked about uh, if this is the case, what about the father? And that is why I'm talking about an appeal to common sense and what she had to say on these matters because people jump from one extreme to another extreme. And we need a people who are not in the middle of anything, but be people who have balanced mind and they can uh, be able to reason out with the truth. And so it was believed that um, no one could take any child to the school because the first teacher of the child from zero to eight years was to be the mother. And, uh, they were not allowed to be in any classroom. So when uh, the, the school opened, there was no provision for zero to eight years children. 
uh, because they had reason that she had said that they have to be taught at home. And not all parents were prepared to meet the ideal she set forth in her earlier writings. And this left not a few children to drift without discipline or proper training during their childhood years. The one deterring to the church making provision for the younger children was the oft-quoted E.G. White statement written in uh, 1872 that uh, parents should be the only teachers of their children until they have reached eight or ten years. And that, that uh, statement, you can find it in uh, uh, Testimonies to the Church, Volume 3, page uh, 137. There seemed to be a marked division of thinking on the part of church officers and members on this important question. What do we do with our eight or 10 years uh, of age children? And uh, as we shall continue seeing that uh, there can be a case of uh, incompetency on the part of the children that they never received any education. And so there is nothing they can pass on their children apart from street education. When I talk, talk about street education is what we call no education. The child is just there at home playing up and down without a curriculum, without an objective, without any program whatsoever. So there seemed to be a marked division of thinking on the part of church officers and members on this important question. What will, uh, what will be the provision for the eight and nine years old children? As time went on, the church school board arranged for an interview with Ellen White at her home early Thursday morning on January 14th, 1904, to discuss this question of uh, school age attendance and the responsibility of the church for the education of young children. W.C. White saw it as, a, as rather a landmark meeting that will set a pattern for other church school schools across the land. So Ellen White was informed in advance of the issue to be discussed and so was prepared to speak to the question in its several aspects. Minutes of the meetings were made and a copy of them was introduced into the general document file in the Elm, Elm Shaven for vault. However, through some oversight, no copy was placed in the regular E.G. White letter and manuscript file. Being minutes of a, a school board meeting, they were lost sight for, uh, of for many years. During a thorough search in 1975 for all materials relating to the early training of children, the minutes of this enlightening uh, interview came to light on April 24, 1975, and were published in full in the Review and Herald, now the Adventist Review of April 24, 1975. And so we have a brief excerpt, excerpts from the 1902 appeal for a church school and that portion of the board minutes of January 14, 1904, which relate directly to the appropriate school age for the children of Adventist parents, um, uh, how the, the meeting went and how it was um, uh, decided. And so we look at this letter in 1887, Ellen White suggested in Testimonies, Volume 5 on pages 583 and 584 that uh, strong young men rooted and grounded in the faith could, if so, counseled by our leading brethren, enter the higher colleges in our land where they will have a wider field for study and observation and who like the Waldensians might do a good work even while gaining their education. These sentiments were repeated several times during the next decade, emphasizing the opportunities this world will give for effective witness in non seventh day Adventist schools at the same time surrounding timely cautions. And so, I want us to look at the excerpts of uh, this meeting that took place in um, uh, 1904 at St. Helena, California. Uh, and uh, these are now in uh, manuscript seven, interview and counsel on age of school entrance. And uh, the information that we shall be looking at, it is portions appear in 3SM and also the entirety of the letter is uh, in 6 MR. And so let us just enter into this and uh, see what uh, we have to glean uh, in this issue, an appeal to common sense, the age of uh, schooling. And uh, allow me to share my screen so that uh, we may be benefited together. I'm so happy. The reason why I'm so happy is that uh, 
the issue of education has been uh, somehow taught and in some runs or in some uh, places pushed to the extent that uh, instead of being uh, something that is uh, productive, it has been counterproductive. In that the people who have taught these messages, I don't blame them, and I'm not saying that I'm presenting the best, but some disservice have been done on it because the follow-up uh, the, the follow of uh, the presentation has been parents withdrawing their children from schools and not giving them any kind of education. And some others withdrawing their children from school, but they are not willing to pay anything for the education of these children. They think that uh, the issue of true education is now is to give them uh, 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 to 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 give them a license to sin with impunity. That is, uh, 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 it has freed them from their responsibility of making sure that uh, the children have an education. This is not the issue. When we are talking about true education, it is giving the best for the children in the highest level and preparing them for the service here below and for the service above. It is more than just a book uh, issue. It is encompasses the, uh, um, the, the the development in the spiritual, the physical, and in the mental. It, it's more than what is offered today as uh, education. And so when you hear about true education, don't think that it is just um, a, 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 a message that uh, will free you from your responsibility of making sure that children can read and write and do the essential things that they have to do. More so, through education, the way it is conducted, it should help the children be able to employ themselves, to be self-sustainable. Another issue is that right now, I'm um, using these gadgets to be able to bring to you the messages live. You need to know how to operate a computer. You need to know how to operate the cameras. You need to know how to type. You need to know how to do research. And so if uh, true education means our children being dwarfs, then the, how will we be better than the, the children of the world? God is calling us to be more than the children of those uh, world and be able to use everything at our disposal to do a work that no other generation has been able to do. Now, if God is calling us to do a uh, 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 something that no other generation has ever been called to do, how much more should we be educated more than what has been ever taught in the past? And so let us, without much ado, uh, go into this. And uh, up to 1902, the educational needs of the children in the neighborhood of the St. Helena Sanitarium were met by the crystal Springs Public School just under the hill. Mr. Anthony, an honest Seventh-day Adventist, was the teacher. On Monday morning, July 14, 1902, before taking up the duties of the day, the parents met to hear Ellen G. White appeal for a church school where the Bible could be taught. To spur the folk in launching the enterprise, she offered to lease without charge a piece of land at the foot of the hill as a site for the proposed school. A one-room building was erected, and in the autumn, Miss Sarah Peck, a teacher and one of Miss White helpers, was called to teach. Miss Peck um, conducted a well-disciplined school with 40 children attending. The initial work made provision primarily for children beyond the ages of 9 or 10. As Ellen White in her 1872 article on education had called for parents to be the only teachers of their children until they have reached eight or 10 years of age, little or no provision was made in the school for such. As is developed in the interview, this was the course quite generally followed. As there were differences of opinion on the policies which should be followed, the school board sought Ellen White's counsel. She was apprised of the problem in advance and met with the board on January 14, 1904. Considering the understanding of the participants regarding the far-reaching na nature of the interview, it is well to identify those present. Now, who are the people who are present? Iram James, chairman of the school board, 
Miss White Farm Manager, LM Bowen, Manager of the St. Helena Sanitarium, CL, CL Taylor, Chaplain of the Sanitarium and Pastor of the Church, HJ H. McDowell, Sanitarium Plant Manager, Miss J. Gotzian, a well to do widow deeply interested in forward moves, a close friend of Ellen White, Miss Sarah Peck, an assistant to Ellen G. White, now the church school teacher. Brother Danielson, a layman, probably a sanitarium employee. There is reference in the interview to Mr. Boeka, manager of sanitarium health food factory. The stenographic report of this meeting has remained in the general subject file of the White Estate, document file number 102, in a folder relating to church schools, but with the unchallenging cover title of report of a meeting of the church school board sanitarium california january 14 1904 concentrated research in the area of education has just disclosed the 26 page document arthur l white february 10 1975 council regarding age of school entrance report of interview now report of a meeting of the sanitarium california church school board held at l Shaven, Sanitarium, California, Thursday morning, January 14, 1904. Sister White spoke for a time as follows, and uh, I, I want us to follow this interview keenly because this is the problem that we are having, and it can be solved by just reading this letter. For years, much instruction has been given me in regard to the importance of maintaining farm discipline in the home. I have tried to write out this instruction and to give it to others. In one of the forthcoming volumes of my writings will be published considerably additional matter on the training of children. Those who assume the responsibilities of parenthood should first consider whether they will be able to surround their children with proper influences. The home is both a family church and a, a family school. The atmosphere of the home should be so spiritual that all the members of the family, parents and children, will be blessed and strengthened by their association with one another. Heavenly influences are educational. Those who are surrounding, those who are surrounded by such influences are being prepared for entrance into the school above. Mothers should be able to instruct their ch little children wisely during the earlier years of childhood. If every mother were capable or capable of doing this, and will take time to teach her children the lessons they should learn in early life, then all children could be kept in the home school until they are eight or nine or 10 years old. And so E.G. White repeats the same statement. If mothers were capable of teaching their children at home, then there will be no need of these children going to school until they are eight to nine years of age. I think that let, let that sink, sink in so well that if they were capable, what if they were not capable? We shall see that. But uh, many enter, many who enter the marriage relation fail of realizing all the sacred responsibilities that motherhood brings. Many are sadly lacking in disciplinary power. In many homes, there is but little discipline, and the children are allowed to do as they please. Such a children drift hither and thither. There is nobody in the home capable of guiding them. A right. Nobody who with wise tact can teach them how to help father and mother. Nobody who can properly lay the foundation that should underlie their future education. Children who are surrounded by these unfortunate conditions are indeed to be pitied. If not afforded an opportunity for proper training outside the home, they are debarred from more many privileges that by right every child should enjoy. This is the life that has been presented to me. Those who are unable to train their children aright should never have assumed the responsibilities of parents. But because of their mistaken judgment, shall we make no effort to help their little ones to form right characters? God desires us to deal with this problem sensibly. This is an appeal to common sense. What if the parents who entered into marriage relation and had children or have children cannot teach them a right. Should we sit by and neglect and say, we never told you to enter into marriage and let these children have street education and then be a problem to the community? Some think by not helping these children, they are solving anything when they are heaping 
problems to the community. And then we should not be reasoning from a worldly standpoint, but reasoning as Christians. More so, we want the children to be educated in a godly way. And if we don't take responsibilities because we are not part of their families, then what we are doing is uh, really ignoring our call to be uh, a people who should convert uh, the community into uh, Christianity. And just converting people to Christianity does not involve only reading to them the Bible, but being able to teach them uh, industrious labor and uh, equip them with the knowledge and the tools possibly that can help them be of benefit to the community and to the church. And so this is an appeal to common sense, the age of uh, taking the children to the school and what kind of schools should they be uh, uh, being taken to. Uh, model church schools to be connected with our sanitarium, so she said. In all our sanitariums, the standard is to be kept high. With this institution should be connected as physicians, managers, and helpers, only those who keep their households in order. The conduct of the children has an influence that tells upon all who come to these sanitariums. God desires that this influence shall be reformatory, and this can be, but care is required. The father and the mother must give special attention to the training of each child, but you know how the families are up on this hillside. The patients understand how it is. The way it is presented to me is that it is a shame that there is not the influence over the young children that there should be. Every one of them should be employed in doing something that is useful. They have been told what to do. If the father cannot be with them, the mother should be instructed how to teach them. And so if these parents entered into marriage and they know nothing about true education, then one of these parents should be trained if the other is busy on how to bring up their children in a godly way. Continued on, we are told, but since I have been here, Ellen White says, the light has been given me that the very best thing that can be done is to have a school, not to leave these children to their parents who cannot teach them. I had no thought that uh, the very little ones would be embraced in the school, not the very little ones. But it will be best to have this school for those who can be instructed and have the restraining influence upon them, which a school teacher should exert. We have a school here because the word of God could not be taught in the other public school. Our brother that teaches that school is fully capable of carrying a school with teaching the word. He is fully capable of doing that. He has his position, they have hired him, and as long as they let him stay undisturbed, he had better stay there. But, there is, but here is a work that must be done for the families and for the children that are as old as seven years and eight years and nine years. We should have a lower department that is a second department where these uh, children could be instructed. They will learn in school that which they frequently do not learn out of school except by association. They, there are to be those who are older that you have confidence in who are trying to be Christians as special monitors. Whenever the children are out of the building, these monitors should take charge of a certain company and see that there is no wrong things carried on among them that is what we used to have when i went to school that is what we that is what was done when the children were let out of recess or at noon and then when in the school the older ones will take charge of the younger ones the teacher will give them the lesson that they should have and then the monitors will carry them on in the study say in spelling in reading and such a things as that and they will become educated the teachers as well as the little children were learners that is the way the primary schools were carried on when I went to school. I thought it was a little strange that they should have these little classes given into the hands of the students. And I asked the teacher if she, should, if, if she would not explain it to me. She said she would. She said that those who were put over these children were learning more in that very discipline of hearing them read and spell and cipher that than it was possible for them to obtain in their classes. That is why they were appointed. Now pause here for a second. Sometimes we complain of not having teachers for the children. But the method that uh, E.G. White went through in school and that which were the, they were going to adopt, I can say 
no one can ever improve on it. It is the best that the Lord had given unto them. And what is this? Say, you have a child who is in school and uh, the child, let us say, is in standard seven. We do not need the teachers for classes one to three when we have students in standard seven and standard eight. These very students who are in standard seven and standard eight are the teachers of those who are in lower classes. The, the children in the upper classes, they should be the teachers for the children in the lower classes. You will be accomplishing a double task with one stone. That is, you are teaching the children in upper class and you are training them to be teachers as they continue with their education. So that at the time that they are finishing their education, they are acquainted with the lessons that should be taught the ones in the lower class, and they will have gained an experience of teaching this young one. And this is the model that actually has to be used even in true education in home circle. Say that I have a child of uh, 10 years in my house, and then we get another born, and the child starts growing. This one whom actually is being schooled should become a teacher of this younger child. And this older one should be educated thoroughly in that she will qualify by the time that this younger one is becoming a student to be the teacher of that student. In that one, you save money, you save facilities, you save books, and you save all such things. If these methods are adopted, then we wouldn't be crying that we don't have teachers who are qualified to be uh, teachers of these lower children in the uh, the children in the lower classes, and so this is what this this is an appeal to common sense, and this is what Ijiwach was saying. If this was so successful in our days, and uh, the children did not lack in anything when it came to experience and education, why can it be adopted and be used at Saint Helena, and uh, uh, because the parents have children which they cannot train we can use our children who are in the upper classes to help these parents to be able to train their own children let that that um, uh, meditate upon that as we continue this should the children be in school that was the question that uh, was bothering the people because she had said that the children of zero to nine to eight years should be at home she answered this now it seems that the question is about these children going to school I want to know from the parents, every one of them, who it is that feels perfectly satisfied with their children as they are without sending them to school, to a school that has Bible lessons, has order, has discipline, and is trying to find something for them to do to occupy their time. I do not think there is anyone, if they come to understand it, who will have objections. So the issue was not just objecting for the children to be in the school, but even are uh, speaking with the parents to see how comfortable are they with this idea. But when I heard that, uh, when I heard what the objections were, that the children could not go to school till they were 10 years old, I wanted to tell you that there was not a Sabbath keeping school when the light was given to me that the children should not attend school until they were old enough to be instructed. Hold on. When she wrote that statement in the testimonies of the church, there was no single school of Sabbath keeping, uh, of Sabbath keepers. And so she said that the best thing to do in order not to contaminate these children with worldlings, because between zero to nine years, that is the, 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 um, the development of a child's brain. And you want the child to uh, 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 interact with only things which are right between zero to nine years so that when her mental or his mental faculties are developed, there is no influence of evil that is interfering with that development. And so when she penned this statement, there was no Sabbath keeping school to train up these children. And so she said, for zero to nine years, let the children be at home and be trained with their parents. And so this brings us again to the issue I presented that time, place, and the context, the reason why she was writing her material have to be considered. Nothing is to be ignored. Time, place, context, and the person they were writing to, they have to be considered. Otherwise we will use the statements of E.G. White 
to uh, uh, just land us into problems instead of providing for solutions. So she says, I penned that statement. And when I was penning it, there was no school for Sabbath keepers. That is why I said what I said. But now things have changed. And what should we be doing? She says, they should be taught at home to know what proper manners were when they went to school and, and uh, not be led astray. The wickedness carried on this on in this common school is almost beyond conception. That is why she said they should not go to the common school or public schools. That is how it is, and my mind has been greatly stirred in regard to the idea why Sister White has said so and so, and Sister White has said so and so, and therefore we are going right up to it. He says, never quote me. If you don't have any better reason for doing what you are doing, never quote me. An appeal to common sense. God wants us to, God wants us all to have what? Common sense. And he wants us to reason from common sense. Circumstances alter conditions. Circumstances change the relation of things. Here is a sanitarium and that sanitarium must carry the highest possible influence inside and out. Then if they see children who come here sharp-eyed, lynx-eyed, wandering about with nothing to do, getting into mischief, and all these things, it is painful to the senses of those that want to keep the reputation of the school. Therefore, I, from the light that God has given me, declare if there is a family that has not the capabilities of educating, nor discipline, and government over their children, requiring obedience, the very best thing is to put them in some place where they will obey. Praise the Lord. Put them in some place where they will be required to obey because obedience is better than sacrifice. Good behavior is to be carried out in every family. We are educating God's little ones in our homes. Now what kind of an education are we giving them? Our words, are they loose and careless and slack? Is there an overbearing disposition? Is there a scolding and fretting because parents have not the powers to manage? The Lord wants us to make all things into, the Lord wants us to take all things into consideration. She continues to say, every parent has on his hands a sum to prove. How are my children? Where are they? Are they coming up for God or for the devil? All these things are to be considered. Now, when she talks about the parents being careful in what they are doing and making sure that they bring up their children in the admonitions of the Lord, uh, I, I want to give you a statement uh, that she says, uh, which is uh, a very important uh, statement. Uh, the cry of a, a mother, something that uh, is truly interesting that uh, I want just to read unto us about um, what E.G. says. And this is coming from uh, pam pamphlets 131, page uh, 6 to page 7. If there is no school, this is what she recommended or this is what she put it in her own words. In all our churches and wherever there is a company of believers, church schools should be established. It's obedience to all, it's obedient to all the commandments of God taught the children in their very first lesson. Is sin represented as an offense toward God? I would rather that children grow up in an ignorance of school education as it is today <clears throat> and employ some other means to teach them. But in this country, Australia, many parents are compelled to send their children to school. Therefore, in local localities where there is a church, a school should be established if there are no more than six children to attend. Establish schools for the children where there are churches, where there are those who assemble to worship God, let there be a school for the children. So she herself says that she would rather see her children grow in ignorance of this education that the world offers, but employ another means of them getting an education. So she is not saying, I'll not give my children education. 
he's saying she would rather see her children grow in ignorance of school education and employ other means to make sure that these children have an education. So no one is freed from the responsibility of making sure that their children is educated. If you decide to take them out of the common schools, then employ other means to make sure that they get an education. Otherwise, you will find a problem. In Australia, the children were compelled to go to schools. And uh, we know even in Kenya, that is the case. But what shall we do? Then we have to establish schools. Continuing on with this interview, she says, the book that is coming out will have much to say in regard to the great principles that are to be carried out in training the children from the very baby in arms. The enemy will work right through those children unless they are disciplined. And uh, I believe the book of education here is uh, what is being referred to. Someone disciplines them. If the mother or the father does not do it, the devil does. That is how it is. He has the control. We want every child to be where he can be impressed in regard to God's claims upon him and to carry God's claims out. The Lord says of Abraham, I know him that he will command his children and household after him to keep the way of the Lord. These children are to come up with a discipline that they will carry out in their lives, wherever they are. Now here is the work and it is no light job to decide what to do. I shall not say so much now because I want to understand just what I should speak on. I want the objections brought forth why children should not have an education. Now, and this is uh, th this is what should be posed to every uh, uh, um, every parent. Why should children not have an education? Why are they at home? Why are they doing nothing? What are the objections that we are having? And so she says, I won't continue speaking much. I want to hear those objections. And let us hear these objections if they are the ones that we are having and how they were settled. We could do the same as they have in Battle Creek. They took me from place to place in the orphan asylum, that is Haskell Home, in Battle Creek or Battle Creek. There were their little tables. There were their little children from five years old and upward. They were being educated on the kindergarten plan, how to work and how to manage. They had a great pile of sand of a proper quality and they were teaching the children how to work together, how to make Noah's Ark and how to make the animals that enter into the Noah's Ark. They were all doing this kind of work. It takes something. Whoever has their children have this education, whoever has their, edu how, whoever has their children have this education should feel an interest to see that the teachers are paid for doing this extra work. And this is one of the problems and we face in this country, Kenya. The parents want to uh, embrace the true education. They go and take their children out of school. And what do they do? They appeal to a certain family or a certain people, take my children and educate them. But then you will never see these parents. No school fee, no maintenance fee, no nothing. Sister Wise says, if you will give your children to somebody or to a school, you have to be responsible and pay for their education and for their upkeep. And more so, you know, we, we have to leave jokes aside and all this stuff. When these parents are taking their children to public schools and common school, they are willing to pay to pay thousands of dollars. They are ready to pay hundreds of shillings for their children to be educated. Now you talk about a true education. They remove the children in these schools and they appeal to those who are experienced to teach their children. But all they have is thank you. My friend, thank you is good. But money is needed for upkeep, for books, for pencils, for pens, for drawing boards for everything to help these children learn. And we should not hide behind this issue that we are Christian, let us help each other. That is not a statement we should be talking when things are bought. And you know, friends, no one has just money in store to do this and this. And um, I'll digress in that, but um, she says that this extra care has to be paid for. 
they there will have to be an extra teacher Sister Pei cannot teach them all. She could not be around, but she could use those that are older to help and oversee and do the things that the children are learning and so they can be worked in. Yet the school should be under the supervision of teachers that carry responsibility. Now, I have a perfect confidence in Sister Pei's teaching, but if she carries on what she has carried on and I am sat satisfied it is just the thing that ought to be done, there will have to be an extra teacher don't you think so, Sister Peck? Now, here the objections and uh, the inquiry starts coming on. So here is Sister Peck speaking. I think if we did the work, I, th I think if we did the work is a satisfact in a satisfactory manner, it's a, it's a satisfactory manner. And if we have any more children, we ought to have some extra help. So as the children increases, we must have a... Uh, 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 um, uh, an increase in uh, 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 in the teachers that are to do the job. Sister White in reply says, my ideas have come out in a crude way, just a jot here and a jot there. I have it written out, but not all. I have more to write. I want you to take care of what I have said. First, understand that this is the light that has been given me in regard to these things. Here are children that are quick. There are children five years old that can be educated as well as many children 10 years old as far as capabilities are concerned to take in the mother's matters and subjects. Now, now I want the I, now I want that just as long as Willie's children are here and they live here, ages Henry and Herbert seven years and Grace three years, I want they should have the discipline of a school. So Earlier she had penned that uh, earlier in the testimonies, testimonies to the church, she had said that uh, children between zero to nine years old should be taught at home by their mothers and no other teacher should be introduced upon them. But she said, I wrote this statement when there was no Sabbath schools, but now we have sanitarium and Sabbath schools. These children should receive an education. And we have here, the children of Willie White, seven years, that is Herbert and Grace, three years in school. So is there any contradictory children of seven years and three years being in school while she penned in earlier writings that uh, uh, the children should not go to school but should be uh, taught with, uh, uh, with, the, with the mother? No, there are no contradictions whatsoever. There are no contradictions uh, whatsoever. And so she continues to say thus, and uh, I'll just like to read some few things here. I like to read some few things. Here, starting with this statement, we have Henry and Herbert, seven years in grace, three years in school. She continues to say, I want they should have the discipline of a school. If it can be connected with this school by putting on an addition to the building, one room say for such a students, everyone of us ought to feel a responsibility to provide that room. Those mothers that want to keep their children at home and are fully competent and will prefer to discipline them themselves why no one has any objection to that? They can do that. But provision is to be made so that the children of all that have an any occasion connection with this food factory and sanitarium and these things that are being carried on here should be educated. We must have it stand to reach the highest standard. And so she says, if we have parents who are competent to train these children at their homes, let them do so. But if the children, if we have parents who are not competent, then let them not be denied a chance of joining these schools and be able to be educated in the way of God. And that is the sanitarium uh, school. And she says that the employees of the sanitarium, they cannot take care of the children. 
because they are employed to do some other work. Let them bring their children to the school so that they may be taught while they themselves do another work. And that is also what we have amongst us, that we have gospel workers who have been called into full-time missionary work. Their children should not be left to languish without an education. They should be given an education by those who are competent. But then they should be able to take care of the expenses of those children while they are being educated, wherever place that they will be educated. We had Elder C.L. Taylor now having to speak. And uh, this is what he said. Sister White, there is one question that I should like to raise regarding the responsibility of parents and the relation of that responsibility to the church school. Now, suppose I have a little boy. I have one, seven years old. We are perfectly capable of training him. We have fitted ourselves to do that work. Now, suppose we choose not to take that responsibility, to neglect the boy, let him drift around. Then, does it become the responsibility of the church to do what I could do if I will do? That is the question. If I don't take care of my boy when I can, when I am able to do it, will I ask the church to do it in my place? That is the question from C.L. Taylor. This is the response from Sister White. You are not compelled to let your boy go out from your jurisdiction unless you want him to. That is your privilege. But those parents who have children out of school and don't take charge of them, if they are not willing to have their children brought in and educated, then let them move off, off of this hill just as quickly as they can because they should not be here. C.S. C.L. Taylor continues, I do not believe you catch my point. I have a boy. Suppose I neglect him. Then must the church go to the expense of fitting up a new building to do what I can do at home but do not do? Through my neglect, must they be put to extra expense to provide a teacher for my child when I can take care of him myself? Sister White, you can take care of them, but do you? So instead of answering the question, she posed the question back to C.L. Taylor. Elder White intervened and said she refuses to, to take your isolated experience. Sister White chipped in. The church here on this hill is a responsible church. It is connected with the outside influences. These influences are constantly brought in to testify of us. The question is, shall it be united and shall it, if it is necessary, prepare a room which won't cost everlastingly too much, a room that these children should come to and have discipline and have a teacher and get brought up where they are prepared for the higher school? Now, that is the question. I say, these little children that are small ought to have education just what they would get in school. They ought to have the children, the school discipline under a person who understands how to deal with children in accordance with their different temperaments. They should try to have these children understand their responsibility to one another and their responsibility to God. They should have fastened in their minds the very principles that are going to fit them for the higher grade and the higher school, which is heaven. Now, there is a higher school that we are all going to, and unless these children are brought up with the right habits and the right thoughts and the right discipline, I wonder how they will ever enter the school above. Where is their reverence? Where are their choice ideas they should cultivate? And all these things, it must be an everyday experience. The mother, as she goes around, is not to fret and to scold and say, you are in my way and I wish you would get away. I wish you would go outdoors or any such a thing. She is to treat her children just as God should treat his older children. He calls us children in his family. He wants us educated and trained according to the principles of the word of God. He wants this education to commend with the little ones. If the mother has not the tact, the ingenuity, if she does not know how to treat human mind, she must put them under somebody that will discipline them and mold and fashion their minds. Now, have I presented it to it so that it can be understood? Is there any point, Willie, that I have in the book that I have not touched here? Elder Willie White, the son of E.G. White, responded, I don't know. I find 
mother that our people throughout the states and throughout the world, I must say, sometimes make very far-reaching rulings based on an isolated statement. Now, in my study of the Bible and in my study of your writings, I have come to believe that there is a principle underlying every precept and that we cannot understand properly the precept without grasping the principle. You know, this is how always we fight. Don't take children to Babylonian schools. Don't take children to common schools. Don't take children to public schools. But we don't understand the underlying principle. It's not just about not taking them to common public uh, schools that we have. The underlying principle is that uh, the children should grow up not interacting with evil, not their tender minds imbibing errors after errors, and so, you know, you can decide to homeschool, but still take your children through these errors that they could have had in public school. You are doing nothing. You are doing nothing different from the common school. If you take the curriculum with errors, if you take the wrong methods of uh, um, educating your children, it doesn't matter how you stand before the people and say, I'm practicing homeschooling and true education. That is not true education and that's not homeschooling. Homeschooling is about instilling in children the principles that will make them have a relationship with their creator and not helping them foster a character that is not fit for the higher education or a higher school, which is heaven. And so uh, it is not just about this common school and public schools, but um, training the children that the way the Lord would want them to be trained. And this is what uh, Willie White is saying, that people go uh, do far-reaching rulings based on isolated statements. Now, in my study of the Bible and my study of your writings, I have come to believe that there is a principle underlying every precept and that we cannot understand properly the precept without grasping the principle. I have believed that in some of the statements which have created a good deal of controversy, like your counsels concerning the use of butter and your statement that only the only teacher that a child should have until it was eight or 10 years old, it was a privilege to grasp the principle. I have believed that in the study of those statements that we should recognize that every precept of God is given in mercy and in consideration of the circumstances. God said, what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. And yet Christ explained the law of divorce as given because of the hardness of their hearts. Because of the degeneracy of the people, a divorce law which was not in God's original plan was permitted. I believe that the principle should be understood in regard to such isolated statements as your protest against the use of butter and the statement that the child should have no other teacher than the mother until it was eight or ten years old. And um, we have seen people who call themselves reformers going beyond what even an uneducated person can go. You find a reformer saying that um, Sister White said the teacher of the child between zero to eight years should be a mother and no one else. And so this reformer will never take pain on educating the child on anything completely because she, he is taking word by word what Sister White wrote. And you just see it, you look at things and you say, may God have mercy upon us, may God help us. And this is the question that I really ask those people who have had liners. So you mean the child has a single parent or what, what are you trying to tell me? If the mother has to handle the child alone, zero to nine years, do you mean that this is single parenting? And how can you escape that this child is not being single parented when you are not doing anything for the child? You think, and people think, that bringing the food on the table is all they can do for their children. And then the rest is left for this and the rest is left for that. We read Sister White's statement, and we should go back to the framework of the teachings of Sister White and see what I presented in number four, how we should be able to study her uh, materials. These isolated statements had their time, they had their place, and they had their reason. And they should not be read as verbal 
uh, inspiration, but thought inspiration. What was she thinking? Who was she addressing? What was the implication? What was the circumstances under which she penned this? And if she will be living in this environment, what would she say different? You know, we don't have to be puppets only to be pulled here and there, but we have to think for ourselves. And that is why the presentation is an appeal to common sense, a framework of understanding what E.G. White meant with her statement, the age of schooling. And so now when that view was given you about butter. This is Willie White continuous. There was presented to you the condition of things, people using butter full of germs. They were drying and cooking in it, and its use was deleterious. But later on, when our people studied into the principle of things, they found that while butter is not best, it may not be so bad as some other evils, and so in some cases, they are using it. I have supposed that this school question was the same. The ideal plan is that the mother should be the teacher, an intelligent teacher such as and one as you have described this morning. But I have felt that it was a great misfortune to our course from Maine to California and from Manitoba to Florida that our people should take that statement that the child should have no teacher but the parent until it is eight or 10 years old as a definite forbidding of those children to have school privileges. If I understand it, that is really the question before us this morning. When the brethren study this matter from the standpoint of the good of the child, from the standpoint of fairness to the parents, as far as I can see, they all acknowledge that there are conditions in which it will be better for the child to have some school privilege than to be ruled out. But there is the precept, a child shall have no teacher but the parents, until it is eight or 10 years old, that settles it. And so they have nothing to take from the precept. They don't have a principle that accompanies the precept, but they take the pre precept word by word, verbal by verbal inspiration instead of thought inspiration. So Elder C.L. Taylor had something to follow up in this interview. He went on. Brother White, I don't think you have that right. So far as our position is concerned, we do not believe that we have any right to bar out any children because of their age, simply because the testimony has said so. We have never talked talk for a moment that we should keep them out because they are too young. We have said repeatedly, if your children want to come to the school, send them. But on the other hand, where the parents are able to take care of their children who are younger than eight or 10 years of age, we have failed they ought to do it and not to make that a responsibility of the child. This is especially so when there is a matter of expense, extra expense involved. So Elder C.L. Taylor, who was in charge of the school says, we are not discounting or um, objecting to these children coming into the school. But the thing that we are concerned with who is going to cater for this extra expense? And this is the question also we have even right now. When you take your children from public school and common schools and you give them to somebody and you yourself can train them, but you are not training them, who should be able to take this extra expense? This was the question that the school had to settle in order to continue. And so the interview continues. Sister White had to respond in this. But before she responded, this is what uh, Elder Taylor had to say. Now that is the only question, we are not holding to a rule saying that no children ex excepting those of certain ages should come to school, but rather we say that those who can educate their children at home ought to do it rather than to send them to the school when we are so hard pressed for means and will have to hire another teacher. Sister White had to chip in and reply, well, if parents have not got it in them, you might just as well stop where you are. He said, if these parents are not competent in educating, then let us just stop there where we are. Therefore, we have to get to make a provision. If the parents cannot uh, educate the children, then we go to make a provision because there are good many parents that have not taken it upon themselves to discipline themselves. They are not disciplined. When the father and mother are disciplined themselves, then we will begin to talk about their disciplining their children. But as long as they are not disciplined themselves, their children are not disciplined. 
There is so much lacking in the matter, so much to be presumed and ventured, that in the name of the Lord, I say, establish something where you can have a mind that realizes the importance of the work of dealing with human minds. There are fathers and mothers who do not know anything about how to deal with human minds. They don't know how. And they cannot deal with their own children. And so these children should go to a place or a school where their minds can be disciplined. Elder C.L. Taylor responded, We will take Brother White's children. If Brother White wants to send his boys, they should go to school. I will never say a word against it in the world. I will never say they should not come to school. But take Brother White or take my own case or take Brother Boeka's. If we can educate our children ourselves, would it not be better for us to do it rather than to send them to school? The response of E.G. White. No one will force anybody to send them to school. If they cannot see the advantage and think that home is the best place, why it is their privilege to stay at home? But then again, there has got to be some advantage. Sister Peck had to come in. I suppose... Sister White, we will never have a church where every family is just what it ought to be. And there will always be these exceptions to meet. And so some provision shall have to be made for those exceptions. Sister White answered, I believe that the people about here that have advantages can each do a little something to support a school for the others. I am willing to do it. I do not think that should be a consideration that should come in at all. We talk of the expense, the expense, the expense. It is nothing at all, at all to have the weight of uh, a thimble full of expense. Now, this is the issue if maybe somebody is not understanding. Here we have parents who can be able to educate their children. They are not doing it. And the children are having street education. Yet the church, the work of the church is to make sure that the community is a community which is a Christian. There is no reason of letting these children to remain without an education. Let the church take the responsibility. The second thing is we have parents who are not disciplined. They don't know how to deal with human minds and they cannot train their children. A provision should be made. But then the expenses, who should be able to meet them? If the parents are able to meet the expenses, let them meet them. But if we have a parent who is so poor and cannot meet the expenses, then it is upon the church to make sure that the children of these parents have an education. And let no parents who can be able to pay for their children take an advantage that they can leave them and the church will have mercy to take their children. Just know that actually you will meet God in judgment. And if it is possible, you will meet the government in this issue. And so the interview continues to say, Elder White said, as my children have been mentioned, I should like to say a word about this. My interest in the outcome of this interview is not how at all with reference to my own children. My interest in the outcome of this interview is with reference to it is influence upon our work throughout the world. My interest for this school from the beginning until now has not been principally with reference to my children. Then Sister White had to say, from the light I have, with every sanitarium that is established anywhere, there should be a school with that sanitarium. That is the light given me. That is how it is we are to see that the children are cared for and the sanitarium shall take an interest to sustain such a thing. It is their business to do it. It is right that they should do it. Friends, let us pause here for a moment. Every sanitarium should have a school. That is what we are being told. No sanitarium should be established without a school. And why was she insisting on this? Because in this sanitarium, we shall have workers. And these workers they will have children, some of them will have children zero to nine years, which have not reached an age to join common schools, public schools, or colleges. What will be, they be doing in the, in the sanitarium compound? You understand in the sanitarium, we shall be having patients, 
we shall be having those who are coming for some schools, uh, for some education in uh, a training in medical missionary work, gardening work, um, teaching Adventist history and such a things. If they have their children there, what will they be doing? They cannot go to the common schools and public school and come with an influence that is not fit for the sanitaria. And so for the provision, uh, a provision should be made in this sanitarium that the children of these workers in the sanitarium shall have a school there where the children can be trained in discipline so that they should show good example to the visitors in the sanitarium, to the patients in the sanitarium, and to the students who are coming to learn various trades and skills in the sanitarium. The children of these parents, the, 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 the children of these uh, Bible workers should be thoroughly trained also. And so that is why she says every sanitarium should have a school and it should be equipped, that school should be equipped and have competent teachers to be able to train up these children in a godly way, not only in the education in secular matters, but education in spiritual things. And that is why the moment we start planning for a sanitaria, next or besides that should be a provision for a school, we should be planning for a provision for the school. Continued on, Elder White says, it is known by everybody that Sister Peck has had a broad experience in teaching and that he has had four years experience with mother, dealing with her writings, helping to prepare the book education, that which is the book that has been recommended to be used for the children zero to nine years. My greatest interest for the school has not been my own family, neither has it been simply the St. Helena's uh, church. My interest in this school lies in the fact that it is our privilege to set a pattern. The successes and failures and the rulings of this school will affect our school, school work throughout California and much further because of Sister Peck's long experience as a teacher and her work with you, mother, in helping to prepare the book or, on education. All these things have, have put this school where it is uh, a city set on a hill. Now, my distress at the ruling with reference to the younger children has been not principally because my children were ruled out, but to build up a ruling which I consider is very cruel. It is being used in a way to do our younger children a great deal of harm. The world is doing a great work for the children through kindergartens. In places where we have institutions and both parents are employed, they will gladly send children to a kindergarten. I have been convinced that in many of our churches, a kindergarten properly conducted for a few hours a day will be a great blessing. I have not found anything in your teachings or rulings, mother, or advice to our people that will be contrary to it. But the rulings of our school superintendents have killed, completely killed, in most parts of the country, any effort toward providing kindergarten work for our children. And so Willie White is saying that zero to nine years of age, a kindergarten school should be established for them and not the statement that zero to nine years uh, should be taught only by the mother. There are few instances where they stand to carry it forward. Dr. Kellogg does it in his orphan's school that you have seen and praised, and in a few other places they are doing it. At uh, Berrien Springs, they ventured last summer to bring in kindergarten teacher and to permit that some, that part of the work, to have a little consideration. But... Generally, in about nine-tenths of the field, this ruling of our school superintendent scales the part of the work completely. Ms. White replied, well, there has got to be a reformation in that line, meaning we should have a kindergarten for these children. Elder White continued, and the ruling in this school here, and the reason that have always been given me for this ruling has been based on your statement that a child's mother is to be, it is only teach until it is eight or ten years old. I have believed that for the best interest of our school work throughout the world, it is our privilege to have such an interview as we have had this morning and also to study into the principle which underlies such a things. Sister White, the mother of W. White, responded, Yes, it is right that it should stand before the people right. Now you will never find a better opportunity to have Sister Peck have the supervision over even the young children, there has got to be a blending in some way. 
As for a room, and there should be a room, I question which is best, whether it should be connected right with the building or whether it should be separate. It seemed to me that it might be a building by itself. I do not know which will be best. That must be considered. The advantages and disadvantages. I think Sister Peck as well, or better than any of the rest of us, could tell how that should be. L.M. Bowen intervened and had this to say. While there has been a ruling as to the age limit, has it not been an account of space? I don't think any of us are opposed to kindergarten work. Brother Den Denison said, it was not altogether on room, was it? I know we talked there with Sister Peck. Did you not explain that the reason why the children were barred out was on account of the testimonies? Sister Peck, we did not have room this year. Elder White, the other thing has been used to cut off discussion. Elder Taylor, Sister Peck has told us over and over again that she has told parents to send their children if they wished. We did not say that they should. Elder White responded, my personal interest as far as sending children to school has entirely passed now. I have no thought of sending my children here. I don't expect to. But in the interest of truth, in the interest of principle, and in the interest of a good understanding of where we are at and how we are to treat other people's children, I am just as much interested as I have ever been. Elder, White, Elder Taylor responded, we have talked this, that the church school will not be a blessing to a community when it comes to take a responsibility that the parents themselves can carry. And when we go ahead and put our money into a building, it does not make any difference whether it is a building or a room. But when we take the responsibility that could be carried by the parents, then the church school becomes a curse or a hindrance rather than a blessing. Now, that is all I have ever heard when we have come to that point. It has been a matter of eight years because we have recognized all the way along that some of six or better able to go to school than others of eight or nine, but it is the principle of others bearing the responsibility. So they saw that uh, even six years old can go to school. Now, so far as anyone here is concerned, I have never known that anyone has kept his children from school because provision was not made. Elder White responded, that is the first intimation that I have ever heard of any such a position. I have never heard that before. Brother Iram James said, that can be so because you will find on the minister um, that uh, Hosman's children were voted out when they wanted to send them. Elder Taylor responded, that was last year when we had no room, but this year it has been talked all along that if they will send them, send them. It looks to me that the church school can become a hindrance if it opens up and says, send the children, it is the best place for them, send your children. Sister Peck in the vein, it has been a question in my mind on that point. Sister White, what our duty as teachers is, whether it was to try to help the parents to see and to take up their responsibility or to take it away from them by taking their children into the school. Now, you have to understand what is happening in this interview. There were people who wanted to send their children to the school, but there was no room. So they were told they cannot send their children there. They took it to be that they were told so because Sister White says children under the age of eight should never be taught by anyone else apart from the mother. Again, you have Elder White, Will Clarence White, the son of E.G. White, who had his own issues. He was able to teach his children but he was not teaching them and he wanted to send them to the school and then there was no kindergarten so he was told they cannot be sent there and so he had some brewing grudge inside himself that he had been told that and so they are trying to bring this interview to some common understanding what was happening if you don't know what is behind the scenes and so here the principal of the school or the management is saying the reason they took that stand is one, they did not have a room. Two, they didn't, ho they didn't have a kindergarten. Number three, the very people who wanted their children to be in school were capable parents who could train them. And the reason for establishing the school was for the needy cases, the parents who could not teach their children. And so the first priority was given to these children which were needy 
and not the children of those who could teach them. And this brought up a very serious controversy in uh, St. Helena. But let us continue with this as we try to see if we'll summarize it. Sister White had to intervene at this point. If they have not felt their responsibility from all the books and writings and sermon, you might roll it on to them from now till the Lord comes and they will not have any burden. It is no use talking about responsibility when they have never felt it. And so we have to thank God for Sister White. While these people are um, exchanging back and forth, she says, what you are doing will never bear any fruit. Here we have a parent who should be sending their children to, who should be taking care of their children and educating them. They have not done so. You cannot force responsibility and you cannot ignore your, the responsibilities. So if the parents cannot do that, let not the church ignore that. It's like you find a drunkard on the road. His own family have refused to take him home. Will you say because the drunkard have capable family members who can take them home and they have not done, I will also not take the drunkard home when it is in your ability to do so. Far be it that such a thing can happen. Far be it that such a thing can happen. And this is what Sister White is saying. You are talking about responsibilities. These people have not taken their responsibilities. Will you not be a Christian enough to do what should be done if you are capable of doing it? And so uh, she said, we, we, we can roll over, but nothing will happen. And so she says, we want to have a school in connection with the sanitarium. It is presented to me that wherever there is a sanitarium, there must be a school and that school must be carried on in a such a way that it makes an impression on all who shall visit the sanitarium. People will come into that school. They will see how that school is managed. It should not be far from the sanitarium so that they can understand. In the management of the school, there is to be the very best kind of discipline. In learning, the students cannot have their own way. They have got to give up their own way to discipline this is a lesson that is yet to be learned by a good many families, but we here, oh, let them do this. They are nothing but children. They will learn when they get older. Well, just as soon a child in my care will begin to show passion and throw himself on the floor, he never did it, but once I want to tell you, I will not let the devil work right through that child and take possession of it. The Lord wants us to understand things. He says, Abraham commanded his children and his household after him, and we want to understand what it means to command, and we want to understand that we have got to take hold of the work if we, if we resist the devil. Well, I do not know whether we are any further along than we began. Almost the meeting ending, and she wants to know if they are understanding each other. Remember, this is number 13 in the presentation there prophets and the messengers. And this uh, presentation is called an appeal to common sense, the age of, of schooling. Elder Taylor responded, yes, I think we are. We have moved a little bit to some understanding, Sister White, but some things have been said. And what are, what is she referring to when she says some things have been said? The case of the children who have been denied to come to that school. One, because they are their parents can be able to teach them, but they have not taken the responsibility. And two, we have we don't have a room. And three, we have no provision for kindergarten. Ellen Bowen have to say this. I think we know what we'll have to do. Sister Godzian uh, said, responded, enough has been said to set us thinking and to do something. Sister White responded, the Lord is in earnest with us. Yes, we have got to be an example. And now you see there are so many sanitariums and so many schools that must be connected with them. We have got to come to our senses and recognize that we have to carry an influence that is an influence in regard to the children. Elder Taylor. There is another matter on the studies. I have a burden for recognizing what Brother White says, that this school should be an example. I have felt that we are still following too much the plan of the public schools. 
that is the common schools of the world. We are cramming the students, the little children carrying all the way from five to 10 studies. It seems to me that we are really, <clears throat> that we really ought to begin to make a change by getting away from the plan of cramming and staffing and get back to the simple principles of teaching them to read and write and spell and getting those foundation things. We should work that plan out here and see if we cannot make a success of those principles that have been given us in the testimonies. So another burden in this uh, discourse was, what should these children learn? How many lessons should they be learning? Because they had taken the curriculum from the public schools, implemented it to use for their schools. And that is basically what we are doing even today. You find that the people who are homeschooling they go and take the curriculum of the public schools and common schools, and they come and staff their children so much so that the children are cramming and there is nothing they are doing but learning so that they may be able to attend to exams. This is not homeschooling. This is street education. This is public education. This is common education. If you are doing that, then know that you are not homeschooling. You are not in true education. The children in home schools should not be taught to cram for exams or to carry a lot of subjects which are unnecessary to them at that point. Let us see how it was responded to this issue of studies and what they should be learning and how many subjects. Sister White had to respond. She said, yes, I think the practical is of great value. The practical working out of these things should be accomplished not by a merely a lesson, but the lesson must be so simple that the students can take it in, digest it, not cram it, and know the reasons for it. If they do that, they, there cannot be so many studies. There must be fewer studies and more drilling. Sister Peck, I think that is right, Sister White. I think we ought to have more thorough drill in the fewer lines of the study. So just take it the way it is. Children from zero to nine years should not be crowded with books and many topics to study and many studies and this issue of cramming. They should be taught few lessons which they can grasp and be drilled. And what is drilling actually? It should be hands-on work, not theory. We are told the children zero to nine years, they should not spend three hours in a desk or within closed nine hours, six hours within closed rooms but they should be allowed free space to roam about in an orderly way and to learn practical things so that their minds may be able to develop mentally and to reason for themselves rather than be a mere reflectors of others' information. Continued on with the interview, we read Elder Taylor responding, as it is now, parents are constantly comparing the church school with the public school. And so this is the issue that we always have. How bright is your child compared to the children going to these other systems of education? They say, if you make a change and begin to cut off certain things from certain classes, why you don't give my children as much as they can get in the public school? Now, may God help me to articulate this right so that uh, it may not come out so rudely. You want your children to have true education. You have brought them to a church school, a home school. And then you'll be asking people to train them the same way the public schools are training their children. Why don't you take your children to those public schools there? If you think that they are being denied something which is better. Why, why come to tempt the people and bring them into more public cities and asking them, to do what is being done in public school when we are trying to correct such errors. Sometimes we have to reason and uh, people take Christianity as some kind of foolishness or some kind of uh, a way of intimidating people and forcing things on people. Listen to what uh, Sister White had to respond as we continue in these matters. Others are complaining, why are you not giving my children what other schools are giving? Sister White had to respond like this. Look at this statement. If they prefer to send their children to the public school, let them send them. 
but this many studies is a great fallacy. Now, if I talk like that, you will say this is rudeness and this is unchristian. But this is the statement of E.G. White, whom many people believe is a messenger of the Lord. She says, if the work of these children, if the work of these parents is to compare our education with the education of the public school and common school, why don't, you, don't they take them there if they think that is the best thing to do? They should not be troubling our teachers, the homeschool teachers and the true education teachers by asking why the things offered in the public schools are not offer, offered in our schools. She says, let them take them there and let them not trouble the management of the school. I have seen such a precious talent that is sacrificed. A father says that a child can have so much money and that is all he can have in his schooling. Some of the most precious youth, the youth came to Battle Creek. The father said so and so. They will go to the public school and they will sit up with little lamb burning long into the night to get all these studies that they have, they had to have. Well, when they came to get through with that, they just broke down. Some of the most precious talent broke down and they died in a short time. Now, where are our children getting so mental and mad every time? And you know, sometimes we think madness is people walking naked on the street or uh, 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 sniffing glue or chewing this and being drug addicted and we call that madness, no? When our children come out of this public school with these many crammings and with many book studies, the children can't think anymore. You will be here speaking with the child and the child is looking at you and they are having a memory lapse. They have put books in their brains until they can't think anymore. And they are, you, you are just talking to a child and the child is not responding. The children are already mental. They are already mad with the education they are having. There's so much they have to take in, in and cram for their education that little practical lessons can be taken in when they come at home. You tell a child to clean the house, clean the utensil, do some few stuff here and there, and what you'll see the child do is something so pathetic. They have been robbed of their brains and their practical skills. Sister White says, at the end, some of them died shortly after these many education, many studies. Sister Peck, even if they don't break down, Sister White, their knowledge is so fragmentary and without foundation that it is of no real use to them after years. The fragmented brain and the fragmented knowledge uh, that they have. Sister White, your school is to be a sample school. It's not to be a sample after the schools of the day. Our work is not to compare our home schools and true educational schools with the public schools. It's not to be any such a thing. Your school is to be according to a plan that is far ahead of these other schools. It is to be a practical thing. The lessons are to be put into practice and not merely a recitation of theory. Elder Taylor has to respond this or had to say this. I am satisfied that when we begin to move in that direction, we will see real light come in. Praise the Lord. And that is what we need to do even today as I'm speaking. Sister White, Brother Lynn, Lynn just children had no need to have died, but they were not under the discipline of the care that they ought to have had. The Lord wants us to have the, that education that we can utilize. And the most simple education that the children can have now is the very best for them. Then there will be a reaching out after more and more education as he has come on but they are not to stuff themselves right now with things clear beyond their years. It is not the right thing to do. We have got to have our ABC and the alpha is not the omega. We must learn that. My idea is to have advantages for the little ones. We are not to throw them into Brother Anthony's school because they are children and don't have to pay anything. Brother Anthony, I believe, will do his best as far as the schooling is connected, concerned, but he cannot teach the Bible. There is the Bible. That is what we want. It is to teach our children when they rise up and when they sit down and when they go out and when they come in. Your children here must be in a school, such a school as that. You cannot teach them 
the commandments of God, the law of God, and importance of the law in a public school. What is their reading lesson? Do they have reading books? Sister White asked. Sister Peck responded, we have three classes in reading. The youngest class uses a little Bible reader that Professor Sutherland got out. I don't know whether you remember it. Another class uses a book that Professor Bell has prepared. And another class is using Mount of Blessing this year. Remember, the book of education was not out. And she said that book, when it comes out, it was to be used in the classes zero to nine years and even in advanced classes. Sister White responded, well, this has got to be worked out some way. Have you got any propositions to make? Let us hear from them. Hear them, Sister Peck. No, I don't know what I have. I don't know that I have any propositions to make. I believe our school board here is solid on the idea of doing everything we can to work out this educational reform. Not simply for the sake of this school here, but for the sake of our educational work in general. I am sure that we all appreciate very much the privilege of having you with us and helping us along this line. I know that we have gotten this morning I know that what we have gotten this morning will really be a great help to us in working out this problem and planning for the school as we ought. We have talked over these matters a good deal in our day and another, and of course we meet a good many difficulties too, and we shall expect to meet them, but we will have to learn how to overcome these difficulties. I have wished a good many times that in our school here, we might have another department, not altogether because the school could be improved, but because I have longed to, I have longed so much for an opportunity to give more time to solving some of these questions that are perplexing the minds of all, all our teachers. I feel sure that I could be a help in some lines more than I am now if I were freer to work out some of these problems. If the problems were solved problems, if it will not require half the energy to execute the work, but so many of our problems are unsolved problems. We have never been over the ground and we are going over a new road. We have to cut our way every step and to do so takes more time and energy and thought than it will when we have been over it once and can go over it again. I have often thought that some of our people feel that we should handle so much because other teachers do and because teachers in ungraded schools in the past have handled all the way from 50 to 100 students and they learn a good deal too but we have another problem altogether to solve. It is another question to manage. Sister White, we are educating for the kingdom, Sister Peck. And everything is new and does mean a great deal more when, we, when the road is new and untried than when we are following a road hundred, hundreds of years old. Ella Taylor had to say this. In the number of studies today, we have duplicated all that the public schools has. And then we have added Bible and nature study and manual training and general, general vocal music. See what they were doing before these interviews. They duplicated all that the public school was doing. Then they added the Bible. They added nature and then manual training. That is like 10 topics to cover for zero to nine years and even other older students. Sister White said, I cannot see a particle of sense in that. Now, I love how Sister White was always straight with things. Seeing how this was so much accumulative, she says, I don't see a practical sense in what you are doing at all. So what did she say then? Just cut off some of those studies. Teach them the Bible. Have that as one of their living practical points of education. That is what it ought to be. She says, cut off some of those studies. We should take no account of how many things they bring out in some other schools. We are on a different road. And that is what Sister Peck say, was saying, that uh, this thing that we are proposing is something so new. It's not 100 years old. It is something on a new road. It is not even on the same road. It is wholly on a new road. When we say a new road, it's a new road, not an old road. She says, things here are not much easier as people think. Now, this is a teacher who had an experience saying this is not a simple thing. And even in our day, let us not deceive ourselves. It is not a simple thing to homeschool. 
it is not a simple thing to have true education. Those who deceive themselves, it's a simple thing. I will dare them to try it again. But we are praying that it happens. But here we had experienced people saying, this is a whole new thing. It is a, a new whole road. Meaning they have to start all over again. But we are thankful that we have not been left in darkness. At least we have these writings and we can pick it. And from the book education, we can know where to head. These people were beginning from the scratch. There was no book of education in their days. And they were having an interview with Sister White, who I dare say had not received every light on this issue of education, but had written some scattered things that could be helpful towards that. If we think that the statements of Sister White are so precise, then try to apply them. Not saying that... Uh, she cannot be our guide. She is our guide, but we cannot take her writings to be verbal inspiration. We have to take them as thought inspiration. And as Willie White says, behind every precept in the Bible and in what E.G. White wrote, there is a general principle. Like what we say, she said that uh, in volume, uh, in testimonies to the church, she said, no child should be taken no other teacher should be given to the children between zero to nine years. But when she was asked why she made that statement and how far it should be taken, she said, when I wrote that, there was no school run by Sabbath keepers. There was no sanitarium having a school. But because now we have these sanitariums, we should start schools to accompany them, to be beside them, to do the work. And because we have parents who cannot teach their children, the children should not be neglected to have street education, but they should have education. Somebody must take a responsibility. And the church, if the parent have not taken the responsibility, the church should not ignore that because they are here to make sure that they are rearing up children for the kingdom of God. And if the parents, take an example. If you have a parent who have neglected to guide their children into the admonitions of the Lord, will the church say, because the parent have refused to train up the child in God's way, we will not do that? While the very work of the church is for the gospel work. Will they say that now because the parents fail the ABC, we cannot do the D and E and F? And so... As it applies to the gospel work, so it is in the educational lines. If there are those who have neglected the responsibilities, the church must come in and do that. And so we are traveling on a new road. We are traveling on a very different road. Elder Taylor has to say this. Now take the matter of history. We have history in the public schools, U.S. history. We are expected to teach history in our church school, but we cannot teach history in our school as they teach it in the public school. Sister Peck at the present time is simply working it out to connect all the events that have come into our history and the history of this country with the Bible in the fulfillment of prophecy. She helps the children to see the signs of the times and the working out of God's plans, and she keeps their minds in touch with God all the time. I have felt that if we could have time in our schools for that, we could cut off other studies that crowd in, and then we would begin to see light come in and our children would get hold of God. Sister White responded like this. I think we should consider that problem. If there are those who do not want to send their children to our school, at which preparation is given for the future eternal life, to learn here the alpha of how they should conduct themselves for the omega, the end, then they can take their children and put them where they please. If this is the public school, all right. What we want is to educate our children for the future immortal life, and we have but a little time to do it in. This is the work to be accomplished. We are to educate them how to be, how to behave, and all of this. I tell you, the teacher carries a big responsibility to inculcate principles to work upon for all time. As we close, we must educate our children so that we can come up to the gates of the city and say, here I am, O Lord, and the children thou hast given me. We must not come up without or 
without our children to hear the words, where is my flock, my little flock that I gave you, that beautiful flock that I gave you, where are they? That is, that is she's quoting Jeremiah 13, 20. And we reply, they have been left to drift right into the world, and so they are unfitted for heaven. What we want is to feed them for heaven so we can present the little flock to God and say, I have done my best. We think that another teacher should be brought in. We need one that has a good all-round disposition, one that is even and that can mold and fashion. These little ones move by impulse just as they feel. I think that care, I think, I think what care the Lord had over the children of Israel. They were so forgetful. He told them just what to do. He told them to plaster the rock and they were to write on this rock the commandments of God. This was after they had, that they have, they passed over Jordan. You see how particular he was. And then there were two mounds. There were places that they had to go through the repetition, one on the Mount of Curses and the other on the Mount of Blessings. From these two prominent positions, the, the advantages of the blessing and the disadvantages of the curse were pronounced. Now, there is um, a wonderful closing quote that she says, did the professed believers in the truth live the truth? They will today all be missionaries. Some will be working in the islands of the sea, some in the different countries of the world. Some will be serving Christ as home missionaries. Not all are called upon to go abroad. Some may be successful in business line and this work they must, they may represent Christ. They may show to the world that the business may be conducted on righteous principles. In strict fidelity to the truth, there may be Christian lawyers, Christian physicians, Christian merchants. Christ may be represented in lawful callings. And that brings us to the end of that interview. There's something that uh, Alonzo Trevor Jones had to say, and if I find it quickly, I'll give it to you. Uh, about uh, these children, how they were growing very important things. And uh, I'll just blow it on the screen. This is from General Conference Bulletin, Gen General Conference Daily Bulletin, February 21, 18, 19, 1899. And uh, let me try to find it in Pioneer section so that we may close with it. This is a very profound statement that uh, Alonzo Trevor Jones gives unto us. Um, when talking about uh, our children who are not in school and uh, the parents are not taking their responsibilities just bear with me a moment and uh, yes this is it i put it in word and we close with it and uh, just do this, blow it out so that we may be able to read it together. So this is what uh, Alonzo Trevor Jones had to say on this issue in closing. Why do we need the school? And here was his response. And the, and what is God and what is God's school for the children? The family, and the home. But for the curse, there never will have been a school established on the earth. How was it with Jesus? He learned at home. Under present circumstances, we must have schools because there are so many parents who are not fit to be parents. And uh, highlighting this, he continues to say, 
they do not know how to teach their children. Therefore, to supply the place of poor orphan child, children with parents, we have to have schools. If the schools do not do any better than the parents, the children might as well stay at home. So this is a very sad statement to hear that uh, there are children who are orphans yet living with their own parents. And why? Because they cannot train their children. And for, so for that, we must have a school to save these children who are orphans living with their own parents. Lastly, why, uh, and this is the same thing that uh, he repeats that uh, we should have the children at uh, the, the school for, uh, uh, we should have, uh, we should have a, a, a school because, um, the the children are living as orphans with their own uh, uh, children. And uh, this is what uh, he adds on that. This is what uh, Alonzo Trevor Jones adds on that. I was looking for this quote and not getting it, but now I have it. Uh, he says, in order to solve the issue of true education, we will have to start from the roots and not the branches. It will be good idea to have schools for the parents. So, because we are having a problem with having schools and children are living as often with their own parents because they cannot educate them, along the Trevor Jones says, let us not start with the branches having schools for the children. Let the children continue being educated where they are. But then our work will be to start at the roots. And what are the roots? It will be a good idea to have schools for what? For parents, so that parents are trained and then they go teach their children. And he says, what we want is to begin in God's order, beginning first with the homeschool, then the church school. In that way, the children will learn, they will grow, and God will come in by his spirit to teach them. If we do not do this thing, we shall never learn how. The way to learn to shoot is just to shoot. I have often thought that the way for a preacher to learn to preach is just to take his Bible and begin to preach. The idea is to get out to do something, thus you will become proficient. And so... With the many words, this is what we are saying. To start at the root, we have to have the schools for the parents. And now those who are even contemplating marriage, they should be taught how to be teachers of the children they are going to get in those marriages. And those who are already in marriages and they cannot take responsibility of their children, one, they should, we should start a school for the parents, and two, we should start a kindergarten and schools for those children so that they may not grow up having street children. And the statement of E.G. White, don't take the children to school until they are nine years, it, we should appeal to common sense. The time when she spoke this, the place, the circumstances, and the context of who she was uh, really writing to. Otherwise, this is the series, The Prophets and the Messengers. This was number 13 an appeal to common sense, the age of schooling. And so I believe that we have learned what we can learn and we will continue having a building block so that we may come to an understanding and our children do not grow in ignorance. We need people who understand computer. We need people who can understand, uh, can be electricians. We need plumbers. We need masons. We need businessmen, administrators. And we cannot afford to have our children having street education and think that they can manage up these things in a Christian way. Otherwise, God bless you. And uh, shall we close up with um, a word of prayer? Again, Lord, we thank you because you are great. And uh, whatever you have purposed for human beings, you have not left them in darkness to grow 
in darkness and not find the light. We have enough light which is in Jesus and we can obtain it for you say if anyone lacks wisdom let him ask and the Lord who giveth without upbraiding will be able to give uh, unto that person. We come before you we have children and there are other children who have parents they are living with them but they are living like orphans. Lord we pray as a church we may not shun our responsibilities. Give us the wisdom that is needed for such a time as this in this arts closing history. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Until the next presentation, uh, I only wish you the best and continue studying to be an approved workmanship, rightly dividing the word of truth, not needing to be ashamed. Bye for now.